evening. Good evening. Tap the screen to access your video controls. Well, I'm just assuming that that it's on video anyway. Hello, how you doing? Hello, little Minty, how you doing? Um, hey, Lydia Cherry, how are you doing? So, hello there, Big Susie the Greyhound. Hello. <laughs> right, okay, so uh, very good evening to you. I'm doing another book club interview this evening and this is going to have a, a kind of a different twist on it in that I'm talking to someone I've spoken to before about this very book, Loving the Brothers, and it's by Pam Haynes. And one of the reasons that I really want to have a chat with her again is because she has another book coming out, Loving the Sisters. Hey there, Susie, which I know many people have been asking, you know, when is it coming out? And I'm hoping that by chatting to her this evening, she can, you know, give you the reasons why it hasn't come out yet. Good evening, Barvik. How are you doing? Good to have you. Good to see you. Very, very enterprising young man. Very enterprising young man. But we'll talk. Barvik, maybe we should do a live. We'll have a chat to, chat to you about, you know, why you are so enterprising. So I'm um, going to be chatting to Pam Haynes. We're going to be talking about the book, Loving the Brothers, Loving the Sisters. We're going to be also talking about, hey, Barry, we're also going to be talking about publishing, writing a book and publishing. I've probably got about eight books inside of me. Why I haven't got going yet? I think it's a publishing thing. I think it's a, a, an emotional thing. But what I love about Pam, she just got in there. She just decided... I'm going to write this book. I'm going to publish this book. I'm going to do it. And it's, it's good. It's very, it's, it's inspirational. And I think sometimes we assume that if somebody isn't in the public eye, uh, that they don't have the drive that other people have. But I would say nothing could be further from the truth. So I'm just waiting for Pam to join me. Uh, yep, yeah, she's joined. Uh, Pam, you need to request to go live with me. There we go. Lovely, jobly. So it's Pam, just waiting for her to come up. Um, yeah, I think we'll be here for about 30 minutes. Hi there, Dalton, 45. Hey, Pam, how are you doing? I'm not too bad, thank you. Can you hear me okay? Oh, I can hear you perfectly, which reminds me the first time we went live. Do you remember I couldn't hear you? Okay. Yeah, yeah. What's going on? And it was last year and we were talking all things Barbados. I did that Barbados month. And That's right. We had South or was it pickled chicken? And we were just, yeah, we were having a good chat. Good chat. So let's recap from that Insta Live. This book, Loving the Brothers, did the rounds, not just in terms of the Bajan community. It did the rounds. And That's right. It was a very, um, what's the word I'm looking for? It was, um, it, oh my God, when, what's that word? When it was, oh God, you know, everybody was on it. Everybody was on it. It was topical. Yeah, topical. But you know, when some, it, it was like, it was like flies. It was like honey and flies were just sticking to it. It was just everywhere you looked on social media, somebody was talking about the book. Loving the Brothers. So let's recap about that book. And let me ask you first and foremost, because it's really hard for me because I want to talk about it, but there could be someone that hasn't started it. There could be someone that started it and hasn't finished it. Yes. I'm going to allow you to talk about the brothers, one twist, and then their partners. Okay. Okay. Um... Well, thank you very much for having me. Um, it's nice to see you again. Pleasure. Um, yeah, Loving the Brothers has been around since 2018. Mm. But you, you think you've told everybody, but they are, I'm still bumping into people who haven't heard about the, the book yet, wow. um, which is really nice. Um, the Morgan Brothers, um, they, which are Manly, Junior and Carlos Morgan, um, from a close-knit Jamaican family. Um, they are based in the UK, they live in the UK, and they meet their partners here. Yeah. Um, there is a death in the family, which means they have to travel to Jamaica, and they take their partners with them. And that's when the, the plot starts to unfold, really, that things aren't really what they, what they seem. So I'll, I'll leave it there, really. Okay. Yeah. 
good. There is a Bajan twist in there, is there not? Yep. Um, the main character is um, Pat, um, Patty Moore, um, Scotland, and um, she is um, a um, adopted by a Barbadian woman. Um, and so there's a fiery Bajan character in there that comes through. And um, Patty's best friend is also a Barbadian um, barrister as well. So you get a lot of, you know, cheese on breads and, um, <laughs> the, you know, we, we talk about um, what goes into making our soup and so on. So, yeah, um, there's a there's that kind of cultural um, aspect of the book as well. There were many cultural um, crossovers in that the book is is Caribbean, but there were different ways that Caribbeans cooked, different Caribbean dialects, different, you know, and I thought it was a very uh, enlightening read. The word I was looking for was addictive. It was an addictive, right. that's the word. Okay. I but it's yeah. That you start by saying not everybody, you know, had heard of it, but I found it was quite addictive. And I found every time I tweeted about it, and especially when I said I was going live with you, I think that was one of the best lives we did in that whole Barbados um, month. But there's lots of really positive cross cultures, how Jamaicans might cook, how Bajans might cook, some rice sauce, some cheese on bread. You know, it was really an enlightening read and I thought it was, was really good. Now, you decided to start writing because your actual job is that you worked in the, now was it social care? No, probation service. Okay. Yeah. So, um, so was was some of your stories or was the essence in some areas of the book based on your work? Uh, most definitely, because you, you, we can all find titles of books um, about the police, about the fire service, about um, social services, but nobody had written about the probation service and um, the kind of work that we do. And a lot of what we do, we can't really talk about either. Um, everybody knows when it goes wrong, but there's a thousand times when it goes right and the public are protected. So I wanted to put the probation service at the heart of the stories and make us the superheroes for once, you know, in a world of where pe we celebrate other people. Not many people are celebrating the work of what me and my colleagues were doing at the time. So I wanted to make sure that what we do is at the heart of the story. It's interesting that you say we always hear about what goes wrong and that then puts a label on the probation service I'm not saying that things don't go wrong but we yeah. want to celebrate what's right as well and I think that's, that's right. so, so important otherwise your whole view of one service is very very one-sided and in absolutely order, got to have balance so yeah. the reach of loving the brothers and I say the reach in that you did insta lives with myself you did insta lives with many other people you were very very active on social media when this book came out correct me if i'm wrong you even did a few interviews in barbados on cbc you did some you know lots of promotion for this book yeah um and you see that's the thing i feel like a one a one one woman bandit really whereas traditional publishers authors they may have a marketing team they may have a, a publicity team or looking at when you're a self-published author you end up having to do everything and i really do believe that nobody can push your book better than you yourself so whenever the invitation comes up there was a book um, um by shonda rhymes called my year of yes where she said yes to everything and 2018 when the book um, came out i just thought let's just say yes to everything even if i don't know how to do it i can learn how to do it and um the radio interviews came in um i you know so i've been on several radio stations i'm not necessarily talking about the book because um that just gives you a launch pad people are asking me to come and do other things as well like miss barbados uk i was a judge on that panel um i've done some things in the states as well and obviously being on TV in Barbados, you know, was um, a really high accolade to be invited on, you know, morning Barbados and do something with their, with their breakfast show. So I've learned, learning more and more the power of saying yes and putting yourself into spaces which, you know, ordinarily I wouldn't be in. So that's been really good. That book by Shonda Rhimes, I think that touched quite a few people, especially if you felt you were set 
in your career if you felt that you were comfortable obviously we're always pushing ourselves but I think that book by Shonda Rhimes it just opened my eyes because to hear somebody of her magnitude talk about That's right. say yes to everything because Thursday nights on ABC probably back in 2018 2017 when you had how to get away with murder Grey's Anatomy and also Scandal on on one night all That's right. Shondaland Productions on ABC you would think to yourself well why would she think I must say yes to everything you would assume that she had it all set every every base was sorted yes. but it's interesting how she explains that in not knowing how to, she said yes, and then found out how to. And was it her sister that said to her, just say yes, just whatever, That's right. just say yes. We have a question that's just come in. A woman who is diligent in her craft can stand before any critique. Okay, that's from Baldy Cat. I'm gonna assume that Baldy Cat's talking about you because you are very, very diligent in your craft. And do excuse me, because I've got a little bit of a cold. So, the reach for the book, absolutely amazing i want to talk to you about loving the sisters because i know for a fact you've been asked on more than one occasion where yes. this coming out now i know you can't give too much away because we're waiting for this book because we want to know what's going down so first and foremost is it the wives and partners of the brothers in loving the brothers Oh, yeah, it's definitely the sequel. So part two, um, Loving the Sisters. I wrote the manuscript during lockdown 2020. Right. And ever since then, I have been touting it around various publishing houses to see if I can get the um, book published. So it's a move away from self-publishing into, uh, I suppose, dipping my big toe into the traditional publishing world to see whether the book is worthy of a publishing deal. So that's where I am with um, Love It and the Sisters. If you watched, like me, if you watched The Real Housewives of Atlanta. Yeah. And if you enjoyed Greenleaf when that was on, then you will enjoy Loving the Sisters. So Loving the Sisters is about um, friendship, loyalty, sisterhood, how the women come together um, to um, plan what they're going to do next in, in, in their relationship. So that's quite important. Away. Don't get too much away. But just the fact that you're talking about the essence of female friendship, which I personally think is something that's really elevated lately. We have friends, but I think there is an essence behind female friendship now that it's so important to have your female friends around you and to be open and to be honest and to be vulnerable. You know, as, absolutely. As Brené Brown says, there is power in vulnerability. Got this one here now. Something's just come up from Just Aish. Loving the Sisters it will be right up my street. So we're really looking forward to Loving the Sisters. Now, you went ahead and self-published Loving the Brothers. That's right. Based on the response and based on the addiction to Loving the Brothers, why have you decided not to self-publish lo Loving the Sisters, bearing in mind how many people have asked you for it? It's not just one yeah, I mean, I think it's safe to say there is an audience of about 3,000 people who are waiting for Loving the Sisters. These are people who are following me on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn. I can't escape every, um, everybody. They are reaching out and wanting to know what's happening with it. And I think for me, I wanted to benefit from getting the book in front of a traditional publisher so that I could benefit from all the other aspects of traditional publishing. So um, rather than me one trying to do the marketing and the publicity side of it and all of that, I wanted to um, you know, benefit from having a marketing team behind me that can get me into spaces that I can't um, seem to get into. And um, in terms of distribution, you know, I want the book to be worldwide. And um, you, know, you find that traditional 
traditional publishers already have those links. So you will be aware that I got the one copy of Loving the, um, the Brothers into Waterstones on the shelf in um, Ilford. Um, but then if you have a traditional publisher, they already have those links with Waterstones nationally. So that's, that's the reason why I think I do think that the story is worthy of a wider audience and um, having more support to get the book out there, which is why I'm going down the road of trying to find a traditional publisher. I know it's a good story. I just need to convince them that it's a good story worth backing. Yes. Got here, Aureus 30. Can't wait to read Loving the Sisters. So it's all there. There's, there's, there's a bit of, well, the addiction starting for Loving the Sisters. But Pam, in self-publishing, were you not able to tap into areas that perhaps a traditional publisher wouldn't have tapped into? Because we assume, I'm just saying, we assume yeah. because a publishing house is a publishing house, they may have the tools to tap into the different cultural areas, the different, you know, sexual areas, the different, um, when I say sexual areas, I mean um, relationship areas. Yes. But sometimes, sometimes they don't, we don't always have all of the tools that are required right across the board. D does that make sense? And I'm not... Yeah that you would have to go to a black publisher. Because I personally think right now is a great time, whether you're black, white, Asian, whatever. Absolutely. It's a fantastic time. And I think more people who are in mixed relationships are opening much more now about the benefits and the richness of different cultures, whether it be food, whether it be music. You know, I just think it is a really, really great time. So you would have to select your publisher quite specifically if that's the right way of putting it oh yeah i mean it has to be a good a good fit and um it's not like i haven't had offers it's just not been the right fit for me so um i i'm willing to wait until I do get that perfect fit. Someone who does understand some of the nuances of what it's like to be black and British um, mm -hmm. and writing our own stories. You know, I'm very much influenced by American authors when I was growing up, but there is something heartwarming about reading stories that, um, you know, that are local, you know, local people, local places that people instantly recognize and writing about the black British experience. So, yeah. you know, I'm very much into wanting to keep that story real. But but I did take Loving the Brothers to a traditional publisher and they wanted me to change too much of the book. So they wanted me to, um, for example, they didn't like the title. So they wanted something else. They didn't understand it. Um, they wanted me to change the cover of the book. Um, and, you know, you've seen the cover, you know what it's like. Yep. And they wanted me to change that. Absolutely. And this is an oil paint and it's, be you know, it's beautiful. Yeah. And they also wanted me to change one of my protagonists as well. And um, they were my three non-negotiables that I didn't want, to, didn't want to change. But I suppose the reason why I'm hoping that there is, has been a change in the publishing world, especially since um, the murder in, um, of George Floyd, all of these publishing houses were coming out and saying, look, you know, we don't know where these black authors are. We want to hear their stories. And that's the reason, one of the reasons why that I've got on this um, pathway in terms of looking for um, a traditional publishing deal. But it has to be the right one um, that understands why I would want to have three black men. And now with the new cover, three black women on the cover. And uh, it's still marketable and it still sells. So you telling me it doesn't, I mean, like, I have proof that you know that it actually does so again it's not me that needs convincing it's the publishing um, world that needs convincing that our stories are worth telling and worth backing absolutely Lydia Cherry says stick to your guns stick to your guns so it is now about the fact that you know things are opening up I find it very very sad that somebody had to be murdered in order for us to be seen to be heard, yes. recognized, to be involved. It was really, really sad. But if that was George Floyd's job to come to this earth to do that, then I do think that his job, you know, it's, it's being fulfilled. It definitely is being fulfilled.
So having spoken now about some of the instances or some of the areas that you were asked to change about Loving the Brothers, would you not go back to some of those same authors with regards to Loving the Sisters? Um, I, I mean, I suppose I have. I mean, what's happened at the moment, there is one um, publisher that's very interested and they have given me loads of feedback on my manuscript. Mm -hmm. And um, I thought that that was a closed door, but actually it's a door that's been left ajar. But when I have readdressed the things they have asked me to look at, in terms of character development and so on, to come back to them. So that looks quite promising. They just haven't said a, you know, a no and that's it, never ever come back. They're saying, look at these areas. The, book, the manuscript is so close to something that we're interested in. Have a look at a couple of things and come back to us. And I have to say that when I um, was with Marcia M Publishing House in Wolverhampton, the feedback that they gave me was similar as well. It wasn't right. We will publish everything regardless of how it looks. They wanted the book to be um, raised to a particular standard. I mean, how could I, for example, have a book about going to a funeral and not talk about nine nights? And I left that out completely. But when you have someone who's um, outside of that bubble who can then look at your book and your manuscript and say, well, actually, I think you've left out something quite essential here. And you develop on your feedback. So, you know, whilst I was, you know, devastated about not being accepted um, um, as I said the door is ajar for me to perfect and work on my craft as uh, the, um, Valerie was saying and then and, and then resubmit it so it's not a completely closed door and um, you've got to get a nine night in there man <laughs> Absolutely, absolutely. Even if it's one day, because now, nowadays people are only doing it for the one day. It had to be in there. And that was crucial feedback for me to grow from. Yeah, yeah. Barry Thomas says, we were, are always involved. It was for them to acknowledge and include us so that we can contribute positively. And Barry, I totally, totally agree with you. And it yes. is, you know, somebody had to, to die so publicly it doesn't seem to be something that's ever going to go away and I don't think that it should ever go away instead of focusing on the pain of the situation let's look at the triumph it is a shame that he's not here it is a shame that his little girl is no longer going to be here but the triumph his name will always go down in history and one of the things that I've always said is I think what stopped the world in their tracks was the fact that at Black Lives Matter marches, some had very few black people. And it was yes. very, very interesting to see that there were whites, there were Asians, there were Indians, Eastern Europeans, and they were like, well, hold on a minute, something here isn't right. This is not right. And I think also, as the world's changing, we need to accept that our children and grandchildren may marry out of their race. That could have been somebody's grandson. That could have been somebody's son-in-law, father-in-law. So it was really important that, you know, that was that was dealt with. But, um, oh, hello, who's this? Af O'Reilly. Hello, Angie. Oh, I freaking love you. I love you too, darling. Good, good. Okay. So in self-publishing, were there not experiences that you picked up that gave you growth? Can you repeat that again? Were in, there... in self publishing, were there not experiences that you had that gave you growth? Oh, absolutely. And I was, um, you know, I, I don't think you find people by accident. So getting to sit next to Marcy M. Spence at an event and her just happening to go into publishing at the right was perfect timing for me as well. We were growing together. I was her first um, author of fiction. Um, as well so it's a you know a different strength she normally specializes in um, memoirs and autobiographies so we were learning on our you know learning on our feet on how we could put loving the brothers um, brothers together and I think I can I know the publishing process quite well now as a result of uh, which is probably why I've got high standards now when I go to a publisher because I know what to expect and what they should be delivering at every stage because I was able to shadow Marcia quite closely um, in, uh, how, in terms of how she runs her business and how she put her book together as well. So, um, yeah, there's definitely lots of advantages of self-publishing. You get your book how you want it to be. 
because you are consulted at every single stage of the book's development. Um, and that's the advantage. So I got to keep my title, I got to keep my cover, and I got to keep my protagonists exactly how I wanted them to be. So there were no, I didn't have to compromise. And that's the difference when you're paying somebody to deliver a publishing service. And then when you go to a traditional publisher, you may have to be a bit more flexible. And 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 one of the big things is, is that fortunately they may, um, they may, consider giving you an advance to finish your um finish your book which is always nice yeah i mean look let's not beat around the bush it's very helpful yes and it, i'm going to assume that there are probably times along the way that even though you were getting all of this knowledge about self-publishing if you know you budget for a certain amount of money to get the book printed get it out there sometimes budgets can get dipped into and you might find yourself having to take money from elsewhere you might find yourself having to do something that perhaps you didn't want to do which means you've got to increase your budget so having a publisher i'm sure that really does help but having said that because we're so waiting for loving the sisters and people are now very much aware and are very addictive to your writing style would it not be a little bit disappointing if a publisher did say, right, we will take you, we will give you everything that you require, but these are the areas that we would like change because we're investing in you. And remember, we're yeah. waiting for this book. Yeah, I mean, uh, I think if you're paying me that I'm open to what those um, changes might be. But at the heart of it, the book is about three black men who are in relationships with three black women and that can't change everything else is a peripheral to whatever what the essential story is about so there are sub um, there are subplots within the book as well patty's going for promotion at work charmaine wants a job and rose is not certain about whether to, she should take on a particular role in church or not yeah. and there are other people from other cultural backgrounds who are on the peripheral but as long as it doesn't undermine the integrity of the story which is about black relationships and how we uh, manage ourselves in that relationships i think anything else is up for you know is up for discussion great i mean at the end of the day um i paid to get my cover done but if a publishing house can come up with a better one that's more marketable i don't know if you've noticed but some authors have different covers on different books depending on which markets they're trying to attract then you know i'm all up for that but if i'm paying for it then this is how i want it to want it to be that does that make sense absolutely absolutely and i think as well it doesn't really matter on the size of your audience your audience is your audience and i've always said if one person just tells another person if your audience if each member of your audience was to just tell one other person you've got a 100 percent increase in your audience do you see what i mean so absolutely i think it's interesting very interesting now pam as a british born bajan and we touched on this the last time yeah Spoke, you were saying now correct me if i'm wrong that there were times growing up in east london as a british born bajan that it was um challenging would, would that be the right way to oh absolutely yeah so tell me about some of the challenges um, I think the majority of people, especially in the area that we lived in, were um, you were a minority within a minority. So you were a minority because you lived in the East End, but you were also a minority because maybe your peers that you were growing up with were first generation um, Jamaicans. Or so we were in within a wider Jamaican community. And, you know, we can sometimes have really bad habits of um, feuding with each other as well mm -hmm. about who is the biggest island and who is the small island and those kind of um, rivalries. Um, but um, we all had a common a common enemy. So the, the National Front was quite, um, you know, quite established in the East End, you know, when I was growing up as well. So it meant a lot of coming together and communities supporting each other. So, you know, that would be the main challenges. Um, 
I did a, did a lecture at um, UEL last week, the University of East London. And, you know, we were talking about, um, you know, what happens after Cynthia Jarrett was um, shot and you know, Sherry Gross was shot and, and Cynthia Jarrett had her heart, atta heart attack and how that led to the uprisings in South London and in North London. And in East London, it was ghostly quiet. You know, there was a huge police presence and I remember having to come home from school early because they feared that whatever was happening in South London and North London was going to spread to East London. So it was a very fearful time to be young and black as, you know, because our, the, all eyes were on us and we didn't know, what, um, didn't know what was going to happen next. So it was a very, very challenging time. Yeah, it, um, it was. I think in some areas it still is because as much as we celebrate the name George Floyd, even though it came out of a uh, death. There are some people who just don't want to hear it. They're, they're, of, you know, they're not interested. And so it, it can sometimes be a difficult time. But I think we're here at this time. So it's really important that we put our best foot forward. And whether it's silently, Absolutely. whether it's open, we, we, we have to educate. And I think it's really important that people understand how we feel. Not so much, oh, woe am I, but it's just important because people do need to understand some of the silences that we've had to keep. Some of the times that we've had, you know what, let it go. Um, but there's only so many times you can let things go. Hey there, sister, Arisha. Yes, this is a great discussion. I'm enjoying this as well. So issues growing up in the East End and some not issues but as you were talking on you know which island are you from and are you from Jamaica or are you from Barbados St Lucia it was almost as though like you say the enemy within the area of the enemy it's it was yeah. difficult yeah mm. but we keep going we keep moving forward so when was the last time you were in Barbados Pam I'm very interested oh. Well, um, I went twice in 2020, so um, I got the chance to go in January 2020. We took friends to Barbados just before the pandemic in January, which was absolutely fantastic. And uh, the last time I went was in um, October 2020, when um, you were aware my mother passed away. So we took we took mum home okay. to Barbados in October 2020, and despite the um, the sadness of the occasion, it was still good to go to the beach and just feel grounded, ground your feet in the sand, and um, you know soak in some vitamin D. And um, I feel closest to my mum to my mum there. So we went to our our favourite beach just just on the one occasion, just to reflect really, and it's um and that was a that was putting me in a good space. Yeah. And are you not, do you not feel a sense of peace because mum's home? Absolutely, because it's where she wanted to be. Beautiful, beautiful. So Pam, loving the brothers, still doing it, still actually, you know, as you say, some people still haven't seen it or heard it. And right, so I'm going to tell you now, loving the brothers, check it out. It's by Pam Haynes. It's an amazing book. We've had some, you know, comments come up here. People can't wait to read Loving the Sisters. Do you have a deadline? And I'm not trying to in any way, shape or form say, don't go with a publisher. But do you have a deadline if it, you didn't get a publisher where you would self-publish again? Do you have that deadline? Yeah, I, I, I think um, the original deadline I had, I wanted to have had a book launch by now. And um, I put down the 5th of December 2021, which has gone, you know, but I did, I did mark the occasion um, thinking, ah, oh, I would have wanted my book to be out by now. But I think if by March um, 2021, that doesn't look like it's going to happen, then I'm going to have to, you know, because there are other stories that are birthing, you know, every time I go to sleep, um, I'm writing Loving the Children at the moment. Oh and then one of my characters popped up a couple of nights ago and she said, well, what about Loving the Widows? And that was new to me. That just took me back a bit, like, um, you know, what are you talking about? So there are, there are store or, or ideas for stories which are coming up all the time. So I need to get this one done so that I can free myself of it. 
give that to the you know give that to the fans give that to the readers and i can concentrate on what my other ideas are i like the way you say free yourself of it it's not a burden it's not a burden but it is something now that needs to be birthed and you that's right this loving the do you know there's so many other adjectives and there's so many other subjects that can come after that and i will say this as well you just touched on loving the widows and i was going to say loving the single women because and, and single men i'm not leaving men out of this and barry's just come up again and i will definitely read that comment yeah. we find ourselves unexpectedly single at a certain age whether that's through divorce separation be becoming a widow there's a bunch of emotions that comes up and i think some women they hold it down for fear of embarrassment the marriage didn't work or the relationship didn't work and you're thinking you know i've got to sort out my children i've now got to be mum and dad and i'm not in any way shape or form saying that men don't feel this way but yeah. as I was saying earlier with the whole loving the sisters thing there is something about female sisterhood at the moment i think that we're very very open to be vulnerable and we're very very open to say listen i can't handle this i asked you to be part of my sky arts book club and that's right ask, and i was not in the place to do that and i'm being very very open about it but because of the females that i had around me of course i got through it i got through it there are some really lovely comments coming here. Barry Thomas, I'm always shouting you girls' names from the rooftops. Team brothers. All right, Barry. So look, maybe we should just get Barry on one day to talk about brotherhood as well. Menopause while black, love that podcast. Not just because I was on it, but it was a subject that needed to be talking about. Loving all these ideas. It's amazing. Look, I just think that there is something here with the loving the. I think the yeah. That's just the start. That is just the start, Pam. Hey, Angela says, can't wait to put all these, for these stories to be birthed, Pam. Yeah, so there's, there's a lot coming out of you. Good evening, Angie and Pam. Good evening to you. So that's why I ask about whether you have a deadline, about whether you will say, right, I'm going to self-publish if nothing happens by and you never know Pam it might take loving the brothers and loving the sisters for a publisher to open up you never know I know you never know you never know and I always say JK Rowling what was it 13 and then she just thought she was just about was it 12 that she was about to give up and 13 said yes or was it 13 and she was about to give up and 14 said yes um I, I don't know the full story but what i do know is that um the editor threw her manuscript in the bin there you go it was somebody else that was passing by and fished it out of the bin and so you know I, and as i said it's not that i haven't had um offers already i can think of at least three right but for me it's the right fit yeah. i want to have the right fit and um you know which is why i'm being would be fussy i've been with the best already i want someone who can equal or exceed that and i think it's worth holding out from i'm not going to sign it away and um and not feel comfortable with this, the decisions that i'm making um so this time round, i want to be comfortable with whoever my next i want to develop a relationship with them beyond um loving the sisters but all the other titles that i know that are coming as well so so yeah i'll, I'll hold out for that great good for you so a couple more comments good evening angie what a great chat well thank you so much what do we have here good evening angie and pam andy franklin would this book be a stage production could you imagine quite easily i went to see nine nights actually at um the Trevalva um, theater oh my, wow it was just so stunningly beautiful now I, I was so i was my first love is the theater and uh, my friend that was with me you know she taps me and she said pam loving the brothers can't you see loving the brothers on the stage yeah i'm going to continue to dream big dreams for myself i think it could easily be turned into a screenplay um, I think it could easily be turned into a production, a BBC production. 
you know i know that um i keep saying that idris elba has the um has the book i hope he picks it up yeah. trying to get it to um people like steve mcqueen you know who i think would do an exquisite job um, with it there is no reason why love and the brothers couldn't be a film and um I, i'm gonna keep dreaming big dreams for myself I, I dreamt the other day i was on the red carpet um and it was something to do with loving the brothers so so you know why not why not just dream big dreams for myself why not absolutely we've got some more okay it will happen it will happen says aureus 30 spilling the tea juliet g never sell yourself short pan you have a brand mm. there okay what else have we got here angela elise 777 you're not being fussy pan you have a precious gift. Andy Franklin, Loving the Brothers, thoughts of a stage production or movie. Listen, Loving the Brothers, stage would be awesome. It's all there. It's all absolutely there. Oh my God, here we got some more. I can see your books on the screen. You are a phenomenal writer. Thought some things, absolutely. The future's looking bright, Pam. Go for it. Uh, I will support you, of course. There's some lovely comments here. So. I'm going to end by saying, first of all, thank you for joining me again. Loving the Brothers, if you haven't read it, make sure that you do. We are looking out for Loving the Sisters. And this morning, I defo need a stage production. And this morning, I was going through some Instagrams and some TikToks and whatever. And I love some of the motivational stuff. And one of the motivation, it was just a short film, it was about five seconds, and it literally was, what if something you always dreamt about was within your reach? Mm. Yeah, beautiful. Because sometimes we think it's a pipe dream. Sometimes we think, oh, it's for someone else. Oh, it's not for me. But what if it was within your reach? And I will leave you with that, Pam. Well, thank you very much for having me, um, Angie. It's always good to talk to you and to talk about the, the book as well. Always a pleasure. Thank you for your time. And we are looking forward to loving the sisters in paperback, in hardback and on the screen. Wonderful. Beautiful. Have a lovely Thanks very much. Take care. Bye for now. Bye-bye.